Hi, welcome to your weekly motoring magazine programme, Four Wheels Good. This week, Mike Rutherford will be talking to BMW's boss, Bernd Pischerstrider, about future developments not just at the famous German mark, but at Rover, and finds out the truth about the new Mini for 2000. We'll feature a report from the recent London Classic Car Show and investigate all the possibilities in the world of car valeting. But first, let's take a closer look at one of the winners of last week's What Car Awards. The winner for the second year running of the performance car category, the BMW M3 Evolution, is put through its paces by Will Hoy. This is one of the road cars that racing drivers queue up to drive. It's BMW's M3 Evolution. M stands for Motorsport 3 for 3 Series, and Evolution means that BMW have been trying to recreate the glory of the original, now classic, BMW M3 of 1987. A terminal velocity of 155 miles an hour, 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds, and stunning brakes, 60 to standstill in just 2.8 seconds. In fact, the brakes are so good, you'd be wise to keep an eye on your rearview mirror, just in case the guy behind you is about to ruin your no claims bonus. This car is the nearest you're going to get to driving a British Touring Car Championship car on the road. I think BMW found themselves a bit of a niche in the market. This car, in this trim, is £43,000. And there really is no other competition at this price level. The nearest is the old-style Jaguar XJS 4-litre at around £45,500. Now, the supercar class doesn't even start till you get to the entry-level Porsche 911, and that's £60,000. So what we've got here is a bit of a bargain basement supercar. And what's more, it's a Grand Tourer. It's got four seats and a boot. OK, it's a bit understated, and it doesn't have the looks of a normal supercar. But that's no bad thing if you want to avoid the attentions of the boys in blue. It may be the poor man's supercar, but at this price you're not exactly going to be skinned, and you're certainly going to expect something special. And if you are tight-fisted, well, you can always opt for the coupe at a mere £37,000. The real soul of this car is BMW's classic six-cylinder engine, now reworked to produce 321 eager Bavarian horses. They're whipped up and reined in by high-tech electronics and the infinitely variable camshafts. That's a lot of grunt, but even so, you do need to push the car hard to get real performance. However, there is a flip side. And that's the sound of the 3.2-litre engine under full power. I'm a racing driver, so unless you're as mad as a hatter, this car really is as safe as houses. But it will still get the adrenaline to flow. I'm in deepest Cheshire at Alton Park, a twisty and demanding circuit, so I have to use all six gears to hustle the car around. I prefer the sequential shift myself, which is an option on this range, since it's not only quicker, but it's what I'm used to in my race car. Dislikes? Well, the main one has to be the steering. Not only does the wheel feel too large, but it also feels overgeared. And then the column itself is just not fully adjustable. On an all too typical public road with its bumps and potholes, this car tends to shake and rattle a bit. That's probably because it doesn't have the stiffness of the saloon or coupe versions. However, it's as sure-footed as a centipede. This is partly due to the limited slip differential, which helps keep the tyres impressively in contact with the road. There is a tendency to understeer when the car is pushed, but that's no bad thing as it helps to keep you out of trouble. There really is oodles and oodles of grip. And if you go one oodle too far and manage to turn the car over, then it's comforting to know that automatic roll bars pop up at the back before you're able to chop off your passengers' heads. And talking of passengers, I've never been in a convertible at 155 miles an hour before, but it sounds as though I'm sticking my head out of a window of a jumbo jet. Overall, well, yes, there are one or two flaws, but it's a great buy and practical with it. And best of all, it has sizzling supercar performance. Which M3? Well, the converter was a lot of fun, but you certainly need the sun. So I think I'd save myself a bit of money and I'd go for the coupe.
Mm, yeah, very nice motor indeed, and one that's very vulnerable out on the mean streets. And with car crime figures so high, you may be thinking twice before buying a car with inadequate security features. Peter Baker reports now on a, a new adaption to an existing system to help retrieve stolen vehicles. This thief could be stealing this car to order or taking it to strip it for parts. However, what he doesn't know is that it's been armed with a technology designed to make sure he doesn't succeed. The latest weapon in the armory against car crime. As soon as the engine is fired, a hidden onboard 24-hour monitor unit detects something is wrong and releases a silent distress signal to a central base. Once the police have been informed of the theft, a homing signal on board the stolen car is immediately activated. Traffic police units then monitor the signal with specialist equipment indicating the strength and the direction of the signal. This particular system is called the Tracker 24-hour monitor and because it can be hidden in any of 30 places in the car, thieves mostly unaware that the system is fitted and police frequently catch the villains red-handed. All 51 police forces in England, Scotland and Wales have been using the original tracker system since 1993 with a 95% success rate. Car owner Kevin is a tracker success story, his wife, however, isn't. We realised about uh, quarter past eight one morning that one vehicle had gone and then immediately that the other one had gone. Reported it to the police, instantly reported it to tracker. By early that afternoon, about five hours, mine had been recovered. My wife didn't have tracker on her, some three weeks later she's still waiting for it. Under the new system, Kevin wouldn't have had to wait until morning to find out his car had been stolen. This is because the technology means it's now the car that raises the alarm and not the owner. This patented technology is expected to have major applications in domestic and industrial markets, such as the remote reading of electricity meters. We introduced the system for trucks and plant users in October of last year, and it's been extremely successful. We wanted to concentrate on the commercial vehicles to begin with, because there was a smaller community, the vehicles were being parked for longer, usually from before a weekend till a Monday morning, and we wanted to see what success rate we had. We've had 100% success with those units, and so we've now decided to introduce it to the wider motoring public for all cars. But what about the police who have to work with the system? Are they really convinced about the effectiveness of this new adaptation to the tracker system? Well, it will give us the upper hand. The moment the activation is made, we will actually be looking for that vehicle. And the, although the success rate is very high at the moment, I am sure the success rate will increase. Car crime figures for this country are frightening. In the UK, a car is stolen every minute. Each year, 150,000 cars are never recovered. In 1995, there were 4.2 million theft-related offences involving cars. They comprised 423,000 thefts of cars, 2.5 million thefts from cars, and 1.3 million attempted thefts. 83% of stolen cars were recovered in 1987. 71% of stolen cars were recovered in 1993 and the last recorded figures only 64% of cars were recovered in 1995. The car criminal is becoming more and more sophisticated as each day moves on. We the police have to move forward with them and in this area electronic tracking devices give us the advantage of being able to move with them. We must keep up with technology and it is good to have these uh, bits of equipment for our purposes. The new Tracker 24-hour monitor is not the only stolen vehicle recovery system and in future weeks we'll be looking at alternative systems. However, it's the only system operated by the police. It's also the only one which uses radio technology, which can be less expensive than alternatives relying on satellite communications. One thing is for sure, however, with technology like this, the warning signal to potential car thieves is now clearer than ever. Mm, another example of how technology is beating the car thief. But shouldn't the technology prevent a break-in or theft in the first place? Well, the tracker system, of course, works on the basis that the car will be driven away. Well, if you're in the market for a new coupe, you'll be spoilt for choice at the moment. At the end of the day, what will be your deciding factor? Performance? Practicality? Price? Or simply the way it looks? Well, if you think you know your coupes, see if you can guess which one is coming clean on its identity.
It's definitely Oriental. But is it a Toyota? No. Mazda? No. This is the Hyundai Coupe SE. If you like to work out or go for the burn, this could be the car to perk you up. The Koreans want to make a significant impact on the British market, and the trick Hyundai are using is the style statement. Hyundai talk about muscular wheel arches, a narrow midsection, and distinctive creases along the waistline. Still, it's got a lovely backside. First thoughts? Well, two litres out there and lots of toys in here. Some leather, electric everything, air conditioning, and it's quiet enough to hear the CD. This car's got more basic gear than many of its competitors like the Probe, the Celica or the BMW Coupe. And at 16,500, it's almost three and a half grand cheaper than the Beamer. We all know the upwardly mobile are addicted to motoring icons that offer instant prestige. And that's where Hyundai may fail. This is their first venture into the sports coupe market. Will its looks and its price be enough to encourage defectors from the big boys? I've covered up the badges just to see if people really do know what they're looking at. I'd say it's a Toyota. Mazda. Daewoo. Mazda. Nope. Looks like an MR2. Mitsubishi. Nope. Is it a Renault? Suzuki. Nope. How much do you think it costs? In the region of about 20k. I would expect to pay nearly 20,000. 25. Um, 18,000 to 20. Under 16. Really? I'd buy it if I had the money. Interesting. I wonder with this Korean heritage, it suffers from too many Japanese curves and not enough Italian designer house. Still don't forget, 20 years ago, we were laughing at the Japanese efforts to entice our purchasing power. We should keep our eyes on this one. Value for money? Well, it comes with a three year unlimited mileage warranty, which is the best you'll get in this class at any price. And you can save yourself another £1,500 by opting for the base model. And all you lose is the leather and the aircon. Will they get as common as muck? Well, I don't think so, because Hyundai only intend to sell 350 of these in the first year. This one is an original press car. You don't want this one. The brakes are a bit light and there's not really much feeling there, but the clutch and the gearbox are OK. And I think you'd be glad of some firm buttocks to cushion the ride when the road surface gets a bit lumpy. Yes, I think this is a ride for the enthusiast. Still, you can carry three others around with you in reasonable comfort if they're long in the leg and don't mind being bent double. It's a good job the sunroof opens outwards, but it's not a great idea on a day like today. And the boot, well, there's generous space in the boot, plenty of room for lots of leggings and leotards. The dashboard is bold, but the instruments do look a little cheap at a second glance. To reality. OK, it's not perfect, but nor is the opposition, and it is cheap. Hyundai want to be taken seriously, and I think they've got this debut just about right. For most people, it's the look, the price, the warranty, and the high equipment level. They're far more important than race-bred suspension and super-powered engines. It'll be interesting to see if this has the Body Beautiful Brigade queuing up for a waistline crease. Indeed, and in the end, style can be everything, can't it? Well, some say that true style is in the lines found in classic cars. After the break, we'll enjoy our first visit to this year's London Classic Motor Show. Hi, welcome back to Four Wheels Good here on Granada's Men and Motors channel. Throughout the country, there are regular classic car shows, but seeing gleaming concours and display vehicles in the historic surroundings of Alexandra Palace is something very special. Hi, this is Richard Warren. I'm at Alexandra Palace in London at the Classic Motor Show, where we should be looking at some classic cars in the next few minutes. Well, I have with me the, auto, the uh, Practical Classics editor, John Pearson, and obviously the show is sponsored by Practical Classics. John, would you like to tell me a little bit about the cars we've got here on the stand with you today? Well, that's it. The cars on the stand, we've got um, a Mini Cooper S, which we've restored ourselves in the magazine as a, a series. It's being run over a year. 
um, show people how to do it, and then hopefully they'll move on and, and do the restorations themselves. The other car we've got is this Jaguar Mark II 3.4, which uh, is a reader's car. We featured it in the magazine two or three issues ago, Practical Classics. Um, the reader took 10 years to restore it from basically uh, a heap of rust with the engine on the back seat, in very, very poor condition indeed. Any idea how much money he's actually spent in those 10 years? I don't think he's added, added it up and I don't think that he would want to. I know that he was offered £30,000 yesterday for it and turned it down. So um, someone thought he'd done a very good job. We do too. The other car we've got is, is my own car. It's a Triumph TR7, which we've, over the last two or three months, we've fitted a V8 engine into to give it a lot more power. And uh, that's also been featured in the magazine. And there's a lot of interest being shown in that. People just interested in improving the TR7, which has had a bit of a, a bit of a poor press really over the years. But there's, there's sort of growing interest in that now. And a lot of people fit bigger engines into them, make make it into a really good car. That's good. No, it's just amazing. You obviously, read in other magazines as well about certain uh, what you would call classic cars, which have sort of inherent problems with engines and electrical problems, and, and people still restore them. Is there any sort of reason for that? Do you think, or is it just because they're uh, slightly sadist and they just want to spend hours working on the car by the side of the road? Um, I, I think I'd have to disagree. I don't think classic cars are unreliable. I think any car, if it's not maintained properly will let you down, but I think a well-maintained classic is as good as anything else. Classic car restoration is, for a lot of people, it's a way of recreating their youth, those sort of wonderful days in the, of the younger years. The, they either buy the cars that they used to own themselves or the cars they, they aspired to. Uh, it can be a Jaguar like this or an E-Type or whatever, and they find themselves with, with a little bit of cash, buy a restoration project fairly cheaply, and, and eventually, it does take a long time, but eventually build themselves a really good car to drive. So if there's anybody out there thinking or, or just speculating about going to buy a, a, a practical car or a classic car, what sort of advice could you give them? Well, buy the best that you can afford. There's no point in buying a heap of rubbish that's going to sit in your garage for a long time, if, you, if, if initially at least you haven't got the expertise to repair it. The second thing is, try and get an expert to go along with you to help you buy it. There are lots and lots of, of uh, classic car clubs. We, if people contact us at the magazine, we'll, we'll point them in the direction of the club specialist. Get someone who really knows the cars to go along with you and help you buy it. And uh, you'll have a lot of enjoyable motoring. Classic cars come in all shapes and sizes, and some of the unusual ones we've seen here today are V8 Ford Pilots. The one behind us is actually a Manchester police car, or was a Manchester police car, and Ian Herbert can now tell us a little bit about its history. Ian? Yes, um, as you quite rightly say, it's a Manchester police car. It came out of the factory in 1951, um, went into service with the Manchester police force, um, serviced the police force well for a number of years before it going into retirement. Um, probably like a lot of pilots, it had a chequered history after that, moving from one person to the next. Most were bought for a song, 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds, and were smoked about until they broke something. Um, this one was one of those. Um, up until three years ago, it had laid idle for nearly nigh on 20 years. Um, when the current owner purchased it, took it home and lovingly restored it to the condition it's in now. And what are sort of the problems you incur with a car which has obviously got a police issue? How, how, how exactly did you get back into these sort of records and find out it was an original police car and a genuine car? Yeah, it's, it's often very difficult. Sometimes um, a lot of forces um, have still got serving officers that remember the vehicles in question. And there's always guys um, within organisations like that are interested in history and keeping records. Um, in this case, um, it was a, a matter of chasing round and eventually they found someone from their old motor pool department who actually remembered the car and said, yes, um, we do remember this particular vehicle. We can't give you much about its service history as to what it actually did, but it worked for the city of Manchester, uh, Manchester and served it well. Stanley, what sort of value do you put on a vehicle like this? And uh, is something that's been a police car or, or a car with a bit more history than, say, an average road car, does that actually add to the value of it or not? 
Yes, it does to certain people. Obviously, the, the, it's again, it's, it's, it's a personal choice. Some people like military vehicles, some people like fire engines, some people like ambulances, and there are certain a, a section of public that like police vehicles. They, they do carry an interest, and I think there's always that sort of little bit of curiosity. You know, was this the car in 1951 that was behind me when I was exceeding the speed limit? <laughs> Ian, thanks for your time. Okay. We'll be meeting more owners of classic cars at the show in future weeks. And a note that we have a regular series of features on really unusual classic car finds in the not-too-distant future, so keep watching. Now, who will win the sales war between two of the very best super minis money can buy? In the red corner, the Volkswagen Polo, and in the blue, the Citroën Saxo. Over the recent weeks, we've seen our fair share of big butch vehicles on four wheels good. Off-roaders, MPVs and muscle cars seem to be coming off every manufacturer's production line. So I think it's time for me to have a bit of driving fun and spend an afternoon in the country with a pair of great-looking, sporty little European numbers. Competition in the pint-sized hot touch range is pretty fierce right now. And these two? Well, they're the new kids on the block. This is the latest addition to the Polo range, VW's Pocket Rocket. It's a 1.4-litre 16-valve bundle of fun that may well be a reincarnation of the much-loved Mark I Golf GTI. And let's not forget Citroen's new arrival to the hugely successful Saxo range. There's the 90-horsepower Saxo VTR and this, its raciest stablemate, the performance-packed 16-valve Saxo VTS. How will they compare in the smiles per mile stakes? Well, first off the mark for a zip in the countryside, I think it's the Citroen. And here comes the boy race a bit. Both newcomers have 16 valve engines with a pair of camshafts. The Saxo's 1.6 engine gives you a hefty 120 horsepower and manages the magical 0 to 60 in a pretty impressive 7.2 seconds. The Saxo also claims the title of fastest super mini. It's capable of an amazing 125 miles per hour. The newly developed engine delivers an impressive power to weight ratio. And if you add that to the close ratios of the gearbox, the Saxo can make it from 0 to 60 with just one gear change. Are you smiling yet? It may well be extremely fast, but safety is an important feature on the Saxo. Standard equipment includes twin airbags, four wheel brakes with ABS, front seat belt pretensioners, still rollover protection, a pre-programmed crumple zone, and even an energy absorbing side impact system. And security also features well. It comes the two-way anti-theft alarm and a coded immobiliser. Perfect to beat those thieves. Equipment levels on the Saxo are high, even as standard. It comes with, well, almost everything. And if all that hasn't grabbed you, then how about the practical net on the underside of the parcel shelf to stop things moving around the boot? Any self-respecting hot hatch enthusiast would be happy to get behind the wheel of the Saxo VTS. It certainly looks the part. The long nose looks great and those flared wheel arches house a stunning set of alloys. And the lower suspension gives it a squat, sporty feel. The Saxo will set you back just under 12 grand for this model with the 1.6 injection VTR version being terrific value for money, at just under 10,000. Fuel economy, well, not bad, an average around town of around 34 miles per gallon. The Saxo's driving position is comfortable and the sport-styled seats give a good ride and hold you in well. The cabin, though, does feel slightly cramped, even though there's good headroom. And the pedals feel a bit awkward, they're a bit too close together. Everything's logically placed inside and where it should be, but the thing is it all feels a little bit dated and it's this overload of black plastic. When a manufacturer is going to learn that a car should look just as good from the inside as it does on the outside. So the Citroen looks great, it's fast and it's certainly safe, but is it fun and how does it handle? Well, those generous tyres give tremendous grip and enable you to get round corners well. The power steering is responsive and the suspension soaks up any road bumps. Overall, ride quality is good, both on the open road and around town. It feels light and nimble and the engine's ready for whatever you can throw at it. The prospect of getting into the Saxo VTS will certainly put you in a good mood for whatever journey you have to go on. Next, for me to go wild in the country in, VW's new baby, the hottest polo of the lot. 
Costing £11,500, this three-door version is slightly cheaper than the Saxo, but how will it compete in the performance stakes? Well, here's the bit you really want to know. The Polo can take you from 0 to 60 in ooh, 10 and a half seconds, but up to an impressive top speed of 170 miles per hour. And like the Saxo, the Polo has a 16-valve engine with twin cams that give out 100 brake horsepower. You've got to remember that the Polo is from the home of the original hot hatch and has rather a lot to live up to. Once behind the wheel, however, you soon get a smile on your face and remember what a pleasure driving can be. It may not have the speed and acceleration of the Saxo, but it's still great fun. And the engine sounds absolutely wonderful. It's a tireless rever, not too overpowering, but if you like that sort of thing, it'll be music to your ears. The Polo handles the road extremely well. The suspension has been lowered to make the most of its underbonic technology, and this together with the firmer springing gives excellent steering. It goes where you want it to go, no questions asked. The Polo is a real pleasure to drive out on the open road when that fun factor can really kick in. But having said that, the Polo won't let you down around town either. Its size, that great acceleration and the responsive steering makes driving it in town centre traffic an absolute breeze. Looks-wise, the Polo certainly isn't as sporty as the Saxo. VW could have made it stand out a bit more, but the familiar shape of the new Polo is fun, funky and chunky. This is added to by the front and rear spoilers and the lowered suspension that shows off its alloys well. It's just a shame that it's so dull inside. Although it feels solid and everything is laid out well, it's just so functional. And we don't want functional, we want fun. Having said that, the Polo certainly has more cabin space than the Citroen and it also boasts a high level of spec, a list as long as your arm. Now you may have spotted the driver's airbag, but you'll have to pay extra for the passengers. Come on VW, think safety. I've got to say that I like the Polo a lot. It's fun and it's certainly fast. A regular pocket rocket with a naughty but nice feel about it. Why nice? Well, the great thing is that you just can't get away from the good old VW feeling of security and reliability. So my afternoon of fun is almost over and I've certainly had a real smile put on my face by these two. Now the question is, which would I take home and carry on the romance with? Well, you can make a case for either of them. Each has got its own appeal. If it's performance and power you're looking for, then the Saxo has it. But the Polo really does pack a punch with its great looks, comfort, and fantastic handling ability. Both vehicles are similar in price, fuel economy, and equipment levels. And when things get this close, it simply becomes a matter of personal taste. And as this is the only German with a sense of humor I've met in a long time, the Polo has to get my vote. And Ginny will be back next week taking a look at four estates currently on the market. OK, it's time for a break and then Mike Rutherford will get an insight behind BMW and Rover when he interviews one of the main bosses of BMW, Bernd Pischestreider. Hi, welcome back. When rumours abounded that German car giant BMW was about to take over our very own Rover car company, many were horrified and predicted the demolition of the only remaining truly British volume car maker in one fell swoop. Here we are, two or three years on. What really are BMW's plans and how much influence will they have on the long-awaited Mini 2000? The boss of BMW rarely gives media interviews, but Mike Rutherford caught up with Europe's number one car chief at the Geneva show, or to be more precise, Mike bullied Herr Pischertreider into giving Men & Motors a world-exclusive interview. Some of the biggest names in the motor industry, there's uh, Bernd Pischerstrider from BMW and he's design chief uh, Wolfgang Reitzler, who's effectively the boss at Rover these days, and we're going to try and get a chat with them. Mindful of the fact that there are minders around and uh, somebody might pounce on me. Busy man, we can't interrupt. 
it's got a multi-billion dollar corporation to run. We got all day, don't worry. Won't be long now. Good news, okay. Hey, Pisha Schreider. Hello. How are you? Good to see you again. Are you well? Yes, very well. How's the business? How's the company? Happy? Well, we can't complain. <laughs> 1996 was an excellent year. Uh, and 97 started successfully, so I'm pleased. Okay. Let's talk about, if we can, two very separate things. First, BMW. Everything seems to be going so well at the moment. I've just come back from the Z3 launch. I've been driving the 5 Series recently. Enjoy it. Everything you're touching is turning to gold, isn't it? Well, not to gold, it's hard work, <laughs> but at the end of the day we're successful, yes, true. I can't think of a car manufacturer that has a more complete range these days than BMW. You seem to be covering every end of the market and doing it also very well. With one exception, which is the Miniman, which is a segment which we don't want to be in. But other than that, yes, we have a full range in our company, Rover does a lot for it. I tell you something that people say to me in England as well, and that's that in the old days they maybe grew up aspiring to own a Mercedes because their father always wanted to own a Mercedes and perhaps couldn't afford one. I think that's kind of changing, and people are thinking more BMW these days. I mean, what? Do, how do you see the relationship between uh, Mercedes and BMW? Apart from the fact that you're absolute enemies, of course. No, we are not enemies. We are no? good friends. <laughs> uh, I mean, competition is always what makes life exciting, isn't yeah. it? No, I mean, uh, Mercedes certainly have chosen a different direction as we have with Rover. Uh, you see their new products here and they're extending uh, their brand. Um, I don't think uh, that this is a strategy which would be appropriate for BMW. I, it could be working for Mercedes. Why would anybody buy a BMW instead of a Mercedes? What are the reasons for it, do you think? Well, it's a more exciting car, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. Well, so do I. <laughs> And uh, I always I remember you said to me once before that you're not interested in things like people carriers and stuff like no. that because you're not in the business of carrying people. You're in the business of sharing sheer... people. Yes, yeah. sure, exactly. Yes, yeah. sure. Yeah. No people movers. You move your heart with a BMW, but not right. people. <laughs> I think that's a good way of putting it. You mentioned the mini car and the the lack of your uh, presence in that sector of the market with BMW, but of course you have that nicely covered with the other small arm of the BMW business, that being Rover. Now we've seen yet another version of the Mini being unveiled here today, but this I gather is several months old. This is not going to be what the new Mini is actually going to look like, is it? No, it's not. Um, clearly, uh, I think we discussed about this already a few years ago. Yep. We had a lot of teams working, competing with each other, what the new Mini should be. <laughs> uh, and obviously we have taken our decision uh, but we want to share with the public what the other ideas were because I think they are all genuine ideas for what a Mini could be. Uh, it's exciting, it's more difficult to develop a new Mini than it would be uh, to develop a new 750. Uh, so we share that with the public and I think uh, whether you look at the Monte Carlo uh, car or those which we're showing here, it's thrilling, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It just shows what Mini can do. But can we see, can we get any clues from this, uh, this vehicle that was unveiled today as to the, the, the genuine new Mini for the next millennium? Is there anything in there that we, could, we will see on the new car? No. Okay. The new car will be a modern new Mini, everybody will recognize it as a Mini, uh, but it will be an entirely different car. And what about the prospect of keeping the old Mini, the current shape Mini, going, uh, maybe as you know the Mini Classic or something, in small production, maybe in a, in a separate facility somewhere, uh, in the same way that maybe uh, Citroen kept the 2CV going for a while. Is there any room to keep that plodding on for a few years yet? Uh, not after the launch of the new Mini. Uh, I don't think it would make a lot of sense. It wouldn't do justice to what the Mini, the genuine traditional Mini is. Uh, we will certainly have a great celebration in Silverstone or God knows where to say farewell to the car of the century, but no continued production. What I'm really saying is, like the 2CV, like the original Volkswagen Beetle, it's too, it's too good to say goodbye to, isn't it? Why don't we keep it? Well, it's pending on the question whether the successor is good enough, yeah. and uh, I'm sure it will. Okay. And the success is going to be much more expensive, of course, isn't it? Well, in Germany, an average Mini sold today uh, costs the equivalent of 10,000, 11,000 pounds. It won't be more expensive than that. Okay. Now, I think it's fair to say that uh, life has not been easy for BMW since it took over Rover. I, I, last time I spoke to you, said you, you said you were pretty happy with the acquisition and there were no regrets. Do you still feel the same? Absolutely, yes. I mean, we knew from the beginning uh, that this is hard work. 
we knew that we have to rebuild the entire dealer network, uh, the wholesale structure, the world around, and uh, that we will have to work on the products. It's, it's exciting. It's our job. We love it. It's great. Mike Rutherford there talking to Herr Bernd Pischett Ryder, another example of Motormouth Rutherford getting his man. Well, now let's uh, return to classic cars and the old chestnut over whether a classic could ever be better value to own and be more satisfying than a modern runabout. Nicky Fox and Eamon O'Neill have been investigating with an extraordinary head-to-head -head drive off. What is it about the classics? Visit a motor museum like this one at Moldsworth outside Chester and you may break your heart. Whether you're in love with their looks or even their value, most enthusiasts would like to take at least one of these home. Now, you might not expect to find one of these in a museum. But this week we put a 1957 Singer Gazelle and a Citroen AX head to head. Have we lost our marbles? No, not really. For a start, both cars are worth around £6,000. Here's the pitch. Imagine you're after your first decent car and just itching for an argument with the bank manager. You know you want cheap insurance and low running costs, but you also know you want something that says you're special. So, if you're Jill the Lass or Jack the Lad, how do these two compare? We chose the AX because it's typical of many small hatchback designs that have been around for a while. Citroen introduced this in 1987, and to keep sales going, they regularly offer good deals on a variety of different specs. This one is called, appropriately, the Spree. It's got pearlescent paint on an angular body, but I'm afraid that is going to suffer badly around these fiddly door handles. Inside, the equipment level is fine. The trim fabric is called Atlas, and I have to admit it does look like the earth from a long way up. The back is for the very occasional passenger, but down there is regularly irritating. You have to be a ballet dancer to find the right position to move your foot from throttle to brake. I think I'll try and persuade Nicky to drive this one. This Mark I Gazelle is an extremely rare model because it boasts a 1500cc Singer engine which dates back to 1927. And don't snigger, it starts first time and is simplicity itself. Cheap parts and no nightmare electronics mean the car is a DIY dream. That is, apart from the front wings. They can rot here because of road dirt collecting underneath and they can't be had for love nor money. So it's repair, not replacement. In the boot, which is the size of the Mersey Tunnel, have a look at the spare. This is an old-fashioned cross-ply tyre, and I expect poor performance from these. But you can fit radials if you want a better drive. One thing you can't improve, though, every thousand miles you have to get out a grease gun and give the transmission and the suspension a squirt. But there again, this is over 25 years old. So you don't pay road tax, and if you can work out your annual mileage, you could be in for a very good classic insurance deal. Now, forget the retro look. This is the real thing. <laughs> Very nice combination of vinyl, walnut and chrome, complete with column change and a bench seat. And no dating jokes please, but yes, there is bags of room in the back as well. 39 years is a long time. Which one of these two could you live with on the road? The Citroen does 0-60 to in 13.5, but this 5-speed feels pleasant and the 950 engine revs easily, so it does feel quite nippy. I agree with Eamon about those pedals, but once you've got it all together, you're OK for comfortable motorway cruising, even with a full load. 6.3 seconds after takeoff, and the Singer reaches 30 miles an hour. Wait another half a minute, and you could be cruising at 65. And once you've got used to this column gear change, well, you have no trouble keeping up with traffic. And if you don't like this arrangement, later and cheaper models have a floor shift. Oops, I was right about the cross plies and the brakes. Originally described as unusually generous, they do need a firm push, but they do the job. For some of you, the Citroen will clearly have a few big advantages over the Singer, like longer service intervals, easier handling and two years free insurance. But remember, as soon as you buy this, it's depreciating. And so I suspect it's your image. Take it from me, this is a real head turner. I'm enjoying a commanding view from a surprisingly comfy seat. But the best bit, this car cost £800 five years ago. The owner reckons he's spent about £1,600 on a respray and other bits and pieces. And now he's got a classic that's worth £6,000. Next year, maybe more. In the end, it's a very personal decision, so just be honest with yourself. If all you want is a no-nonsense commuter box, go for this little fella. 
On the other hand, if you're a petrol head and don't spend all your life on a motorway, here's temptation and a bit of a pose. Yes, an interesting and uh, bold experiment, but it's true that at the end of the day, the choice of vehicle is a very personal one. Well, we'll take a quick break now and we'll be back with Sterling Moss. Welcome back to Four Wheels Good, your weekly motoring magazine, right here on Granada's Men and Motors channel. With the general election looming, it's an appropriate time to think about what politicians do or don't do for us motorists. Mike Rutherford is in conversation now with the one and only Sterling Moss. Well, it's sort of election season and uh, maybe we'll have a new government in the, within the next few months. I think whether we have a new government or not, I think it's probably true that we'll have a new transport minister. Yeah. Sterling, what do you think of these guys? Yeah, they've got a difficult job. Yeah, their hands are tied yeah, but by Mike, the Treasury. Look, the teams to me with government, if you get to know something too well, they move you out. Yeah. I mean, we had, Barbara, we had Barbara Castle. She couldn't drive, but she became Minister of Transport. And I presume she did a fairly good job for a while. Yeah. Then they said, my God, she's learning too much. Move her out. Yeah. And it seems each time we get somebody in, when they once get to grip with it, mm. either it's too much or they don't want them in it. Now, what was Barbara Castle famous for? She, she, 70 she, mile an hour limit. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. she brought that in. And this is, this is brought in by somebody who doesn't drive. Yes. Mm. Says well, it all, really, doesn't it? I think it does. I don't see how you can cap that one. But the point is there is so much that should be done and needs to be done. You know, there really is. I, I think it's, a, it's an enormous job, a terribly important job, an all-encompassing thing, because most people drive. We've got, what, 25 million-odd cars? Yep. Yep. And I don't know how many licenses. And we're all touched by the car, even if we don't like it, right. or by transport. And so there are an awful lot of things, I think, Yeah, and let's done. not forget that even those people that don't drive, and there is a mi minority of adults that don't drive, mm. they're regular users of cars. They might be using their partner's car. They might be in the passenger seat of their partner's yeah, or, car or on every a bus, day. Or yeah, yeah. Quite. Uh, or, or a taxi. I mean, people, forget, people talk about public transport. Um, you know, taxis are public transport. They're motor cars as well. So as you say, we're all touched by it. Seems to me, though, it's quite simple that it doesn't have the priority it deserves, does it? I mean, no. everybody talks about chancellors and defence ministers and all the rest of it. The transport minister's job is, seems to me one of the most important jobs in Britain and should have a higher profile. I agree. I, th I think it's very, very important. I think it's a person who needs a fairly big budget. I think things ought to be done a tremendous amount, not only to the roads, but to the laws and so on. And I think that somebody's got to take the bull by the horns and get moving on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally feel they ought to consider uh, turning left on red lights after stopping. Yep. Uh, in America, it works extremely well, right on the, uh, in most states, I don't think all states, mm. but I think there are quite just, a few things like that. Now, that's a good one, because just to explain that to people who, who are not familiar with it, you come to a red light in the States, remember you're driving on the other side of the road, if there's nothing coming, despite the fact that it says red light and you shouldn't it go, you can actually nip around the corner, not cross the junction, mm. but just turn right. In this country, it would be, of course, turning left yeah. on a red. And it works very well. I've never seen anything approaching a near accident in that situation. It's a simple thing. It could be brought in tomorrow. It will make the world an easier place, or it will make Britain an easier place yeah, to live know, in. Yeah, but Mike, look. Am I being we, idealistic? Am I yes, being, you are, yeah, certainly. Yeah, but we have that. a roundabout. So naive. Now, a roundabout should work where people come in, but now we have traffic lights on yeah, roundabouts. Yeah. Well, I mean, that defeats the whole idea of a roundabout. Yeah, quite. I, I can't, and when they, when you've got a T-junction, I don't see why you can't have, keep one lane flowing if you put a, put a divider down. I mean, yeah. the, there are so many things, um, uh, you know, that could be done on the road without too much expense, yeah. and they keep building these great big islands in the middle and mm. taking the road away from us motorists and mm. saying this is a bus lane, and, and then when you have a bus lane, people don't read the sign. No. How many times have you been on a bus lane when, when people are out in the middle when they shouldn't be because it's Absolutely. no longer a bus lane? I mean, quite, quite often the bus lane only exists between, say, 7 in the morning till exactly, 10 in the exactly. morning. Exactly. And that yeah. means for the other 21 hours of that day, you can use them. Yeah, of course, they do. Of course, if you go hacking up the inside lane, up that bus lane, and you overtake somebody in the inside, the chances are you're going to get then be done for inappropriate overtaking. I, I must say, I don't know if you, mm. if you would, but I... I it's a grey area. Grey area. Yeah, yeah very grey. Very grey. But, I mean... It just seems to me that it's a simple subject that's made very, very complicated. If you said to most motorists out there in the field, living day to day with all the problems of congestion and all the rest of it, you, th so much of it could be made much simpler. I mean, for example, an investment of 50 quid, 100 quid by painting an instruction on the road, it costs nothing. It's there for years. It mm. could cause 
it can create such a better driving environment, and yet they won't spend that 50, 100 quid by painting that sign on the road. No, well, it's the same with, with road signs, isn't it? With street signs and all those sort of things. There's no continuity. No. If only we had to look at one particular point to see where we were, that would help people. They'd know where they were or where they're trying to go. The road signs is another thing that I think this country is not very good at, no. that's for sure. It has to be said, though, in fairness, even countries like America, which have great signs because they, they have signs that you can... You know, are so unambiguous. I mean, they have signs like yeah, you but know, they change the names of a road in the middle of the road. They do that. You start off in one, that suddenly becomes another one. Yeah, That's a bad and deal. I tell you, the other thing they are terrible at. If you go to somewhere like Los Angeles Airport, for example, from downtown LA, there will be absolutely no signs for the airport until you arrive at the airport and you can physically see it twenty yards away from you, and there'll be a sign then saying yeah. LA Airport. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're pretty bad at that. So to put Britain into context, I think. You know, we're bad at road signs, and so are our foreign competitors. But we, we ought to be able to be better. We could be better. Yeah, I, I mean, we're improving communications in all walks of life. This is the, the age of communication improvements, and yet nobody's doing really any great thing on, on road signs. No, but we see until we get a, until we get a minister of transport who gives gives these things well not necessarily priority yeah. but brings them to the forefront and puts somebody in charge yeah. of doing. I mean, they've just done a thing at Hyde Park Corner, which quite honestly has backed up traffic like two or three hundred yards. Right. And I called up the the head of traffic, and he right. came out and he said, "Oh, well, I'll get somebody to call you." Right. That was months ago. Nobody's called me, right. and it's still there. I think I've got an answer actually, and that's um, I should do the job. Would you? Uh, would I'll you second you. I'll uh, second you. You reckon I could? I could I, cope with it. I would be happy to see you try. Well, let me tell you. Off the top of my head, first thing we we'll do is we'll take we'll review speed limits. We'll do things like improving signs, graded we'll, licenses, graded licenses, right. insurance discs on windscreens, um, coloured uh, coloured uh, cat size for when you're coming up to a, to a major road. That's good. And, and the other one, of course, is a VIP lane for me and Sterling. Just every road in the country, a little <laughs> lane that we can bomb up, just like those princes and those. Uh, Kings do in uh, Thailand or wherever. <laughs> well, that's all for this week. On next week's programme, we'll test out three different types of navigation system. A report from Mike Rutherford in Scotland, driving mm -hmm. the new BMW 5 Series Touring. <coughs> and Ginny Buckley will have a group test with estates from Ford, Peugeot, Vauxhall and Renault. We'll see you then. <laughs>